Because so in addition to your I Heart Putin shirt, you all you also have an I Heart Bethesda shirt. Yeah. <laughs> Welcome to the Settlers of Soul podcast. This is Arius Dare. Well, it's been a busy couple of months. I do apologize for not getting another conversation out to you all sooner. Hoping to be a bit more regular with the publishing as we move into the fall. Anyway, our guest on this episode is Dimitri Diomin. He's a computer engineer working in the gaming industry here in Korea. And he's got a pretty interesting backstory, too. Uh, Dimitri was born in the former Soviet Union in what is now Turkmenistan. He was literally a Russian hacker before it was cool, working for the Turkmen government, and eventually made his way out here to South Korea some 10 years ago. We talk about growing up in Turkmenistan, the game industry in South Korea, and what it's like working at Epic Games Korea, Dimitri's current employer. The first few minutes are a pretty technical discussion on game engine design, so if you'd prefer to skip ahead to about the 8 minute mark, where we talk more about Korea specifically, please feel free. All right, let's get to it. I'm sitting here with Dimitri Diomin. Welcome, Dimitri. Uh, hello, Aris. Sorry, I think I butchered butchered your name already. <laughs> that is Five fine. seconds in the interview, I'm already mispronouncing mm-hmm. things. But so, Dimitri, what do you do here in Korea? I work here as a engineer, and I work in the game companies here. Currently, I'm working in the Epic Games as an engine programmer. Epic Games actually it's um, it's American company, and we they have the outpost here in Korea where we mostly provide support for our technology, but also developing some features in the engine that are useful for the game developers here, specifically in Korea. Now, is Epic Games, is it well known in the Korean market? Yeah, actually, Epic Games was making the games, actual games, and I think the most famous, the first most famous game, it was uh, Unreal. It's a kind of 3D shooter. And it was like a long time ago, I think, somewhere in 97, I think it was released. I, 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 I don't remember for for sure. But after that, uh, they're starting to make the another famous series of the games. It's a Unreal Tournament. Most of the gamers know these games. While they were releasing the games, they actually start licensing the engine that was used in that games. And that engine actually became very popular among the uh, Korean game companies. I know a, lo- a lot of popular Korean games that was released in the past use the uh, Unreal Engine technology. I think the most famous Korean game that uses Unreal Engine is uh, Player Unknown Battlegrounds. Yeah, right. I've seen that. Yeah, that game is really, really popular here and in the uh, world. Did, did you have a hand in, in making that? Well, they use our technology, our engine. I mean, that is made in by Epic Games. But when I started working in Epic Games, it was like uh, what, four years ago. And uh, the first tasks that I was working on in the in the engine, it was... Uh, better support for the games that has a big open worlds. I see. So, so you were not working specifically on a game, but what you were doing was you were providing support for developers that were using the engine to then make their own project. Yes. So we we was actually making Unreal Engine better for the open world like a Skyrim. We, we, we was just making, adding some features in the engine that it will be easier for developer to make such a games with a big open worlds. Specifically, I added a lot of things to the engine that was not there before. And right now we see that uh, you have that game, Battlegrounds. And that game, I know it uses a lot of features that I personally made, actually. <laughs> could, you, uh, could, could you name one? Well, they do use a special feature like um, rebasing the origin. It's very technical. It's kind of hard to maybe explain to a non-technical audience. Well, give us a shot. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure there's at least one person that will be familiar with what you're talking about. That one person is not me, but that definitely one of our audience members might. Well, it, one of the problems with the open world games is that uh, computers, they compute some numbers. They use a kind of special representation of the numbers that uh, degrades precision so when you use the bigger numbers the precision of that number actually when you do some operation is it like adding two numbers they are you can think about you have the five and you have the three and when you add them together you get not the eight but you get maybe 8.5 mm-hmm. so it's a the, the operation becomes less precise the bigger number is like i'm talking about numbers like uh one million four million ten millions so at 
that magnitude, the precision is really bad. And the problem when you're making the open world games, you have to use big numbers. Because you have the very big world, it can be like a 4 million. The, per, per, the numbers in the player location can be magnitude of 4 million or 10 million. Right. I, I just I, I stumbled across a, a video the other day on, on Reddit where this guy has been trying to find the absolute limit to the Minecraft universe. And he's basically just been walking out to the edge something like three years now. Because what happens is, I, my understanding is that Minecraft is basically just replicating itself the farther you go, right? So it, what it is, is it's creating some sort of random features, some sort of random trees, cliffs, mm -hmm. mountains, what have you, but that it's basically just kind of copying it as you go, right? It's not gen generating new code, but what it's doing is it's using previous code mm -hmm. to you know create a consistent experience. But the theory is that the farther you go out, that that will have a really hard time, that code will have a really hard time replicating so there's supposed to be some some glitches, some some really strange stuff that's going to happen. Is that a little bit of what you're talking about? Yeah, probably. Because uh, <clears throat> so what happens actually when you have the big numbers and <clears throat> you do the operations, you will see some glitches in the game. For your your player, for example, will not moving smooth, but he will a little bit kind of have some really how to say jagged movements. Ja jagged movement, yeah. And your camera will not be smooth. It will be. When you rotate the camera, it will actually do this jagged movement. Mm -hmm. So it's a problem with the precision of the numbers. And it happens only when you're making the op big open world games because you can have the locations that are very far away from the center. The feature was I'm, I added to the engine, it allows you to move the center of the world to another location. And that was something that you had a direct hand in. Yeah, usually the world center is the zero zero. You can move that zero zero to another location at game runtime. So, for example, your player has a location like a one million something something, and you move the world origin to player location, and his location becomes zero. So it's very small number. So all the operations be become very precise when you do. For example, he will run without any ja so jagging. So all you Battlegrounds fans, when you have that really sm buttery smooth uh, <laughs> player experience, just remember who to thank for that, I guess. And uh, <clears throat> yeah, they also use a lot more features that also was had, uh, I mean, d direct involvement is, is uh, kind of, it's uh, more like a support for making more simple versions of the environment. For example, the pro again, the, the, the problem with open world games, you can see a lot. You have the open world, so you can stand in some mountain and see a lot of objects in ahead of you, like uh, kilometers away from you. So there are a lot of objects. And if you put the, for every object, if you put very precise uh, version of it, uh, I mean, the performance of the game will be degraded because you have a lot of, you can see a lot of objects on your screen. So I made you, it's, uh, you can actually merge several objects into one and simplify them. Also, you can even merge the really big parts of the, your world together into one single object and simplify it. So the whole district in your game that there can be a lot of objects like a uh, houses, windows, and it's the whole district. You can merge it together into one object and make it very simple. So Now, is this reflective of a lot of the work that Epic Games Korea does? I understand that you have offices in, in China and Japan, uh, several other countries around the world. Um, is, is the Epic Games Korea office then focused much more on development support, or do you have other responsibilities as well? Well, in Epic Games, we have around 15 people, and uh, right now... We have only two guys here that uh, work directly on the engine features, adding features, fixing the bugs. But we have several people who actually provide the direct support for the game developers in Korea. So we have the ded dedicated persons that are actually working with the local game developers and listening to their problems with our engine or and they can answer the questions how to use the engine properly, how to don't use it and how to avoid some I mean, issues and, yeah, the things like that. Epic Games, the main product, it's a uh, engine itself, Unreal Engine. But uh, Epic Games also making games. You know some of them, it's uh, like uh, Paragon right now, Fortnite. Gears of War was, was quite popular. In yeah, Gears of War, but it was a long time ago. Right. So so then let, let's talk about your, your work life. I understand that you worked for a, a few companies before you finally settled down here at Epic Games. What was the experience like working for these kind of smaller, I don't know if you'd call them startups, but smaller game companies uh, in Korea, kind of domestic companies, before transferring to an American-owned company? What I 
I can say about the working in the Korean company is that uh, it's not that bad, but we still had a very long working hours. And I think it's uh, quite common for the game industry. It's not Korean specific, but uh, it's a really big difference when you join the Epic Games because the management here is much better and strict and the overtime is rarely it happens yeah but it's not that common as in korean companies i worked before now what what language uh is unreal engine written in um and do you, do you find that that is a uh, you know difficult to then relate to the korean developer community so for example i i i have a good friend she's a she's a headhunter at a at a different company and they have been looking for a good python coder for months now and there are apparently very few skilled python coders in korea everybody knows javascript or mm. java um in the us it's 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 very different python is everywhere python is i mean that's what i learned when i was going to school studying political science right you know do some basic regression analysis and it's a very common, easy to learn language, and it's surprising that you don't have that competency here. So, you know, in Korea, uh, what languages do you do you find are most often used for gaming, um, and does that clash at all with the work you do here at Epic? In the game industry, you have to make when you write the code, you have to be sure that this code will run well on PlayStation Four, on mobiles, on very. D- Pl- different platforms. Is that what Unreal is written in? Yeah, it's mostly written on C++ because yeah, it's a language that actually you have to use if you want to. I mean, it's a kind of standard. Python can be used only. No, it cannot be used directly in game. It can be used as a script language for some writing some gameplay related stuff like uh, scripting the quest in the game. It can be used to power the actual game, actually. And the Python mostly used as a automation tool. You can script, for example, pipeline of how you create the assets for the, for your game, stuff like that. But it's not used directly in the game. So all the game developers, most of the game developers, if, I mean, if you're making your games for mobiles or for consoles or for PC, they have to know the C++ language. And they don't have to usually no any other language except C++. Yeah. I mean, C++ is... Now, I understand that Unreal Engine has many applications beyond gaming. What kind of innovative applications have you seen here in Korea? Or maybe maybe not Korea, but just uh, you know, in, in general, maybe in Asia or or Russia? Unreal Engine, originally, it's a, it was made for making the games. But uh, right now, we see actually that Unreal Engine used very successfully used not 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 in the gaming industry but uh, in the enterprise and uh, the most common use i mean apart from games it's uh, making the architectural visualization for example a lot of developers not the game developers are right now using the unreal engine to make the design of the interiors the benefit of using the unreal engine for the visualization of the of the design of the architectural for example you you making some room like it's a real time because an uh, engine is made to make the real time games so the all the rendering the is real time when, whenever something happens it's real time so and when the architects use that unreal engine to make the rooms or something like buildings you can use unreal engine as a real-time renderer so you Im- immediately see the results when you you can enter w- what you built inside the room and you immediately see the all the results so it, and you can walk i mean virtually walk around your room what you built you know that there is a programs like uh, 3d max maya where you can make some something and render it and right to render it actually you have to spend some time i mean it will slowly render one frame right now people use the unreal engine because you can just make your design your room and you you don't have to wait to render it you immediately see the i mean in all the beauty how it's rendered in real time what other shifts have you seen in the korean gaming community since you first came here um mobile i guess would be the big the big thing in the last 10 years but are there certain defining characteristics that you might ascribe to gamers here? The one big shift that happened here, actually, when when I came to Korea, I was working on the console game. It was very unusual because consoles 
uh, not popular in Korea at all. There is very, I think, few companies in Korea that actually make games for consoles. For some reason, consoles are not popular here. I don't know why. And uh, when I came to Korea, the most popular games here was MMOs. Mm -hmm. Lineage 2, I mean. That. And uh, so... Say 2006, so I guess that would have been StarCraft as well. Yeah, yeah, StarCraft was also popular. But uh, most of the game companies here actually was making some MMO games. Because of that, here in Korea, when I joined Epic Games, we actually was working on features to support the game companies here. And game companies here was mostly making the open world MMO games. So I was working to, on, to improve that uh, open world aspect in the engine. But uh, after maybe two years, we actually switched our efforts to support mobile here. We basically stopped adding some features for the open world, now focus it on mobile. I mean, the, here in Korean, Korean office. Game companies, they stop making <laughs> open world MMO games. The battleground is kind of an exception. Well, all, all the money is in mobile now. Yeah, so most of the game companies right now are making the mobile games. So so that's a, happened actually really kind of quickly, like maybe in one year, that shift from open world to mobile. There are a lot of Korean game companies that are using our agent and made really good the uh, mobile games like maybe you heard the um, lineage revolution i've seen the advertisements for it yeah and uh, it actually made a lot of money and the guys are very happy from yeah the, those two generally go hand in hand right making lots of money and overall happiness yeah <laughs> so mm -hmm. so I, i'm wondering how does somebody with your skills then end up in south korea well maybe, maybe start with where are you originally from Actually, I was born in USSR, but USSR doesn't exist right now. And, uh, well, you know that USSR was kind of union of the 15 republics. And I was born in the republic that was right now has a, it's a separate country. And um, the name is Turkmenistan. Was it called the Republic of Turkmenistan or was it something different? Yeah, I think it's translated as the Republic of Turkmenistan when it was in the part of the USSR. But right now it's just Turkmenistan. So it's a not well-known country. There is no much there actually in Turkmenistan. It's a, basically most of the land, it's a just desert. <coughs> when the Turkmenistan became the independent, we had a president. His name was Sapar, Sapar Murat Niyazov. And uh, <coughs> he was president for, oh, yeah, I don't remember, more than 10 years, I think. And uh, the... The issue is, after, I think, a few years, he actually became the lifetime president. He made very kind of closed country. It, it was really hard for foreigners to get the visa, actually, to Turkmenistan. It was really hard, I know, because, uh, yeah. And didn't he write a book and launch that book into space? Yeah, actually, <laughs> yeah, there are a lot of things. Do you, do you go out stargazing every night and you try to spot the satellite? and Do you do, you do a little prayer? Or? No, I, I, I never read this book. Yeah. So while he was a president, he, he wrote the book and uh, that book, the name is Ruhnama. It's a, actually, it's kind of codex, like how to behave and all. It's also has some history parts. It became really kind of, that book became really part of the every citizen of Turkmenistan. So for example, when you, if you want to get into the university, you had to pass the exam by from this book actually. So you will have the, for example, if you go, if you want to go to the math, you will have to math exams, and you will have the exam by for this book Ruhnama. <laughs> I think something similar exists or was in the China. Yes, they yes. have some some kind of red book. So it it was kind of like that. Yeah, and uh, yeah, he went further and uh, start renaming the days of the week he was he started renaming the months of the year to some i don't know everywhere actually in every office you had to have the his picture on the wall so mm -hmm. did uh did, did he also provide you with computers with running the unreal engine uh, how, how did you first get involved with uh with computers computers was my kind of hobby when i was really young like maybe 10 years old what kind of computers did you have in the ussr well, we had, yeah, computers that are made in the USSR. They wasn't really good, yeah, and kind of old. But I think in the 90s, 1990s, somewhere, we start having the that PCs in, with Intels. 
At that time, actually, I start really kind of like to program. I didn't have the PC at home, my personal PC, but I was visiting the uh, first in the schools and in the university. The some classes with the PC where I can had uh, my time to type uh, programs and do something here. And uh, eventually, we bought the PC at home, and I I was still in the university at that time. I think yeah, when we bought the PC, and I started yeah really like the programming, and I I was in the university actually I didn't study the anything related to computer science. I was studying the physics. It was a some theoretical physics. So, so computers, uh, I'm I'm sorry, coding or, or or engineering was was purely a hobby for you. Yeah, it was purely a hobby, but I I really like it. Yeah. I knew that uh, after I finished my study, I mean, university, I I will not work as a scientist or physician. I mean, I will find the work that uh, it should be de- developed. You wanted yeah. to go somewhere with kimchi, clearly. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I wasn't thinking about the South Korea at that time. I, all, all I knew about the South Korea, it's uh, Samsung, because we had the uh, electronics from Samsung, I mean, in the shops. Now you uh, you said you were born in the Soviet Union, and then when you left, it was Turkmenistan. So, can you talk about that shift? How old were you when the USSR fell, and did you see any major differences in your day to day life? Yeah, the I was like uh, ten years old, but uh, I remember that uh, the first thing I remember that was changed actually for me: chocolate is gone from the shops. I don't know <laughs> what happened, but it's just gone. I, I really like Ukrainian uh, chocolates, right? Yeah, actually, the chocolate was produced, I think, the most of the chocolate was produced in USSR in Russia and in Ukraine. And uh, when the USSR broke apart, all the chocolate that was coming from the Russia and Ukraine it just stopped coming and you don't have it. So <laughs> yeah, for a 10-year-old, that probably does sound like the end of the world. But um, you know, you were you were kind of a, a tinkerer and, and, and an explorer when it came to technology. Did you notice uh, a difference in the type of materials that you had access to? I mean, did computers dry up? Did you now have a surplus of, of non-Russian PCs? W- what actually changed it, we actually got access to the to foreign things. Like, I, I first found, found out that uh, there is uh, actual things, things like uh, game consoles. And oh, really? <laughs> yeah. So I remember... Somewhere in the early 90s, we traveled to Moscow, and when we went inside the shop, I saw the, the game consoles. It was a 8-bit, like a Nintendo replication. It's not, it was not original Nintendo, but it was kind of, I think it, it was from China, some replications of the Nintendo, but it was working. I mean, you can play the Mario and stuff. We bought that console. And I was really, really happy. And yeah, that game console actually made me actually kind of defined my future, why I became actually engineer and why I became engineer spe- specifically in the game industry. Yeah. So was there a was there a specific console that was that was popular in Turkmenistan? I mean, in, in the U.S., right? You, it was like Nintendo, Xbox, PlayStation, and then Xbox is winning out, and now I believe it's PlayStation. Um, but in Turkmenistan, was was Nintendo king? No, actually, in Turkmenistan, the consoles start become the common thing with the uh, Sega Mega Drive, I think. In Turkmenistan, they start opening the like uh, PC buns where you can go and you have the TVs and yeah, well, what, what is with P- Sega Mega Drive. What would you say PC bang in Russian? How would that translate? Computer club. Okay. It's a, it's a, on Russian. It's a yeah computer club, I think. Yeah. Which translates literally as computer room. The club, co- co- computer club, computer yeah. club. Yeah. Computer clubs was really popular because. For most people, the consoles uh, was still kind of expensive to buy. Turkmenistan was never kind of rich country, so people, most of the people are not rich. So they couldn't afford the console to have console at home. So PC clubs was very popular. So there was a lot of, I mean, young and children that was playing the Mortal Kombat. And yeah. Yeah. W- what year did you first come to Korea? I came to Korea in 2006. So it's already 11 years. Wow. When I think about it, wow, that how come I still here for 11 years? How have I survived? <laughs> <Yeah>. 11 years. <laughs> so was, was it the kimchi that brought you here? Uh, why, why Korea? I mean, with it, it, it sounds like, again, you, know, you, you seem like a very competent computer engineer. And especially back then, I, I would well, imagine that there was, uh, you know. I, well, I, 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 I wasn't that competent uh, when I came to Korea. I mean, I was just uh, kind of starting when I finished my university, I, I was 
I started to work in some company in Turkmenistan that was making solutions for the government. Like, uh, you know, the Turkmenistan was very kind of closed country and there was <laughs> a lot of documents and processing related to, to just, you actually have to have to get the permission to leave the country. So it's a special document. We have to go to the, I think it was. You got to get your papers. Yeah. You, you cannot just buy the ticket and to take the, for example, if you want to go to Russia, you cannot just get the, buy the ticket, get the Russian visa and fly. No, you can't. You, you have to go to the Ministry of the Foreign Affairs in Turkmenistan. I get the permission to leave the country. It's a <laughs> Korea was the only country they let you go to? Well, permission was not for long. It was for several years. But we actually was developing the programs for the Ministry of Foreign Affairs that was helping them process all the documents, like uh, whenever the person is requesting some permission to leave the country, they have to put all the information to the computer, into the database. So we was developing all that solution to help the process all that documents. Big brother. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> something like that. Yeah, so I was working in that company, like over there, I really kind of start to understand how to do things, how to engineer, and I, I start to become actually work as a programmer. You know that uh, all my childhood I was playing games and still while working, I, I always played games at my home on my PC. So I really liked that and I really wanted to work as a game developer. But in Turkmenistan, there was, was no any game development, only just general stuff. And in Russia at the time also, there was not much actually game development at all. It, for some reason, it was not that popular in Russia. I had a friend, engineer. He was working here for one year, developing something. While he was here, he actually was approached by a guy from local game company and asked him to join to his company. Because, yeah. So he came back to the Turkmenistan after one year and uh, started preparing documents to go again to join that game company. That game company was looking for more engineers and uh, he recommended me to that company. So it's not that hard actually for you to go to Korea, but the working visa, the company who invites you, they have to prepare a lot of documents and submit them to the, some ministry here and wait for a long time to get the approval and then they and I can get the working visa in my passport and came to Korea actually. Now how how was your English at this time? My English wasn't good actually at that time. I it became much better right now but when I came to Korea I can fluently read I couldn't speak very well. I'm I'm sorry actually just a clarification so in Turkmenistan you speak Turkmeni but you yourself do not speak Turk, I'm sorry, Turkmen is, is, is what you say it, right? Yeah. And But you yourself do not speak Turkmen. You speak only Russian. Uh, could you explain why that is? Did, is there a generational thing? Is it because of the USSR? They, they, they didn't allow these other languages? No, they did allow. The, uh, so my family are Russians. My parents, they don't know the Turkmen language. At home, we always was talking on Russian. In the USSR, the main language was Russian. Every republic has to learn Russian. And second language was the local language in every republic. So, for example, in Turkmenistan, the second language was the Turkmen language. So when you went to, uh, did you go to public school in Turkmenistan? Yeah, it was a public pu public school and all public school was... The curriculum was in Russian, the books were in Russian. Yeah, everything in Russian. I don't think we had the schools that teach only on local language but i'm not sure maybe somewhere in the villages but uh, not in the all public schools in towns i was teaching in russian we, we didn't have to learn many because we didn't see a reason why why why, why will you learn it because everyone speak russian and yeah uh, how, how quickly did that change after 1990 when i was 17 all the public schools were still teaching on russian all the books were still in russian so and that books was still kind of old soviet books when I was 17, so it's already 1997, I passed the exam to the university. And the exams also was on Russian, everything in Russian. So we studied on Russian in the university. Because one of the reasons also why it was so slow, because not all the teachers could speak Turkmen language. So it's really hard to, actually, I mean, you, you have to find the new teachers somewhere and replace all, in all the public schools to start. So it wasn't that simple. So I was... After three years in the university, the things start to change. So they start forcing the 
Turkmen language in the schools. And at the end of the fourth year, my last year, they really start hardening the things that they have to be in local language. So I think my last exam it has to be in the Turkmen language. Somehow they made the exception for the... So, so you, you started the semester filling out exams in Russian, and then by the end of the semester, you had to do your final in Turkmen. Yes. So they actually said that it has to be in Turkmen, but yeah, they made the ex- exception. And it was the last year where Russian was allowed. So w- w- when you go back, um, do people still speak Russian? Can you still get around? Can you still I mean, socialize? Could you theoretically get a job again? Well, last time I w- went to Turkmenistan, it was like maybe four or five years ago. The people of my generation, they still speak Russian, so I, I have no problems. So people 100 plus, right? 100. <laughs> yeah, the people actually who was born at least in 1980s or early 90s, they still can speak Russian. Very young generation, like who was born already in 2000s, late 2000s, they don't speak Russian at all. Millennials ruining everything, right? Yeah. <laughs> now, so I understand, though, like, you actually, you kind of were saved at the last minute by uh, Mr. Vladimir Putin uh, in terms of your citizenship. So can you can you talk a little bit about that? Back in 2006, you, you wrote a letter. Okay, when that uh, USSR broke apart, the Russia, there was a lot of Russian people that was living outside of Russia in the republics. All the Russians who was, for example, in Turkmenistan, they got the Turkmen passport. They didn't have any Russian passport because they are not living in Russia. So what Russian government did, they allowed the second citizenship. So in your country, for example, in Turkmenistan, you go, you can go to the Russian embassy and uh, ask for the Russian citizenship. At the time, a lot of Russians was living in Turkmenistan, going back to Russia. How big was the community? I mean, you, your I mean, parents. The Turkmenistan is not that big doesn't have the big population. It's about, about, I think, 5 million. And I think maybe 10% was Russians, maybe. Okay, so maybe it, 5%. Yeah, it's not, a, it's not yeah. a small community. Yeah, but uh, yeah, it, 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 we didn't actually think about, oh, you are Russian or you are Turkmenistan at that time because the USSR was really good at uh, kind of uniting the different nations together. Well, you know, as I learned in America, you are all communist robots. So you guys were all the same with no personalities, correct? <laughs> that... Well, no. I mean, I, that's, uh, sometimes when I watch the American Hollywood movies, when they talk about the communism, yeah, it's, for me, it's really off how they think about the communists. Yeah, that's things that... the. America beat the Nazis in, in the World War II, so that's also really pissed. I mean, the Russians are really pissed off when they think of, I mean, hear about this. There are a lot of myths about the communism and World War II on Russia side. To, to see that they still exist when you watch the Hollywood movies or you play some game. Yeah, and I, I think one of the things that you, you see is that... Uh, Putin is not a very helpful or benevolent guy, but it seems that he helped you. Yeah, so about the dual citizenships, officially Russia stopped giving the second citizenship at that time. It was 2002 maybe, the last time. And I didn't get the, any Russian citizenship. In 2006, uh, 2005, actually, we really started to think about leaving the Turkmenistan to go to Russia. I went to the Russian embassy in Turkmenistan and ask them, can I get the... I'm, I'm a Russian, so I, I want to go to Russia. Can I get the passport? And they said that, uh, well, it's already a bit late. We stopped giving the second citizenship. But what you can do, write the letter to Putin and ask him politely to give you the Russian... D- directly to Putin, not yeah, the... Yeah, directly to Putin, yeah. Not the Kremlin, but like, dear Mr. Putin. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So explain that you are Russian and you want to go back to Russia. So I, I wrote that letter sent it to Putin and after one year so it was in I think it was in 2005 somewhere and uh, in 2006 that happened that uh, my friend came back from Korea and he recommended me to the game company and I passed the interview and I start preparing the visa to go to the Korea and uh, I got all the tickets and I was ready to flew on the next day and the day before my flight someone called from Russian embassy I said you have to come yeah Please come. I came and they gave me the Russian passport. <laughs> Just one day. <laughs> day before. So you had already gotten your visa approved as a, as a, as a Turkmen. Yeah. So the Korean my, my Korean visa was in the Turkmen passport. Yeah. So because uh, I did. Yeah. When I was 
preparing the visa, I didn't think that I will have the Russian passport. So it's just one day before I left Turkmenistan, they gave me the passport. Now, is the Russian community large here? Um, I've had another uh, Ruski on my, my show before, um, and she said it, it's, it's not actually that huge, but um, she's also about 20 years younger than you. So I'm wondering, um, you know, maybe you guys have different professional and social circles. The Russians I know about here, it's mostly they work in the Samsung. There is actually quite big Russian community over there in Samsung. I'm I'm not sure about you know right which, now. Which subsidy, like Samsung Electronics or yeah, Samsung Electronics. Mm. Actually, they they hired a lot of Russians. Maybe some uh, hacking training, I guess. <laughs> Maybe yeah, they they actually work in very different fields. They in Samsung, not only engineering. I mean, it was actually like maybe f- five, six years ago, it was a really big community over there in Suwon. Yeah, I, I, I guess, you know, they're going to be moving to Pyongyang here pretty soon because the uh, the big semiconductor plant is being constructed there. So you might see kind of a, a mini migration of Russians move to Pyongyang from Suwon. I think they reduced the number of foreigners in the Samsung. I, I don't know what happened there, but but I think the biggest community here is not Russian, but uh, from Asian republics of USSR. Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan. The stands, as it's... Yeah, the stands. More, <laughs> more, more appropriately called. I don't know about appropriately, but more commonly called. Yeah. So, are, yeah, actually, that, 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 is a, that is actually a, a good and question. The, so do, do you have other Turkmeni friends? No. Turkmen. Uh, Turkmeni is not, a, is not a term. Correct? Okay, let me... I think it's a Turkmen's, if you want to say. The Tur- Turkmen's. Turkmen's. Yeah. Are there other Turkmen's in Korea? I have a one guy on Facebook, I think, who... Stays here. Everybody <laughs> has one guy on Facebook. I, mean, <laughs> I, I never met him. That but doesn't tell I, us anything. Actually, I think he stays here in Korea for a very long time, and he's uh, from Turkmenistan. But uh, I don't think there is uh, many. How do you find Koreans respond when you tell them that you're you're Turk you're a Turkmen, or do you just say that no. I'm Russian? Yeah, I always say I'm Russian because uh, whenever I try to say that I am from Turkmenistan, they almost no one knows where is it. Where so I always had to explain where is it. So I always say, do you know the Caspian Sea? And on the east side of the Caspian Sea, there is a country, Turkmenistan. What is uh, what is the reaction when you say, I'm Russian? That's normal. Everyone knows what the Russia is. And yeah, usually they say, it's sometimes it's, the conversation becomes really interesting. For example, once I was catch the cab, the taxi drivers, they, taxi drivers sometimes they really kind of want to talk. So they start asking, where are you from? I say, Russia. And he said, oh, Russia, Dostoevsky, I really like him. He said that in English, but uh, I was really surprised. But, uh, I mean, people know the authors from the Russia. And, yeah. yeah, I don't think that any other group of people on the planet can describe despair and sadness and hopelessness like the Russians can. I, I didn't know that Dostoevsky is such a popular author, actually, outside of Russia. I was always thinking that it's kind of... Only a Russian three. But so, so generally, it's been pretty positive. Then uh, you haven't had any. I mean, you're white, so that helps. But yeah. you know, <laughs> you, you you don't get any type of, of pushback or um, you know any type of ill ill will. Yeah, directed your way. You, you know that there are, if I can say, the benefits of being the foreigner in the career. So sometimes you kind of avoid some rules that you have to follow. Yeah. People don't want to argue with you. I mean, you're a foreigner, and all right. Ready for the rapid fire round, Dimitri? Yeah, sure. I like that enthusiasm. Yeah, sure. First question: What do you miss most about Turkmenistan? Uh, actually, in Turkmenistan, there, you know, there are not that much people, but, but the territory actually is quite big for the population. So the density of people. Are, so there are a lot of places in the Turkmenistan that are barely touched by the, uh, I mean, people. Where, where would you recommend if? Uh, for you know, for tourists, if I wanted to go to one of those places, there is not much to see. Actually, it's mostly desert, and uh, we have a lot of mountains. The mountains are really good, actually. So hiking, mountain biking. Yeah, hiking. Yeah, but it's really hot over there, so you have to be prepared. Yeah, to go maybe you cannot go there on summer because it's really really hot, like fifty degrees this time. And go fishing. Yeah, the fishing, hike. so we have some, okay, we have the Caspian Sea and we have some small lakes. The best time I had it's uh, on the lakes. We used to go there to, for fishing, so that's that's what I miss. Because here in Korea, I know that there is uh, places like lakes 
you can go for phishing, but they are mostly kind of standardized. So I think it's uh, not the wild lake. I mean, that you can just come and start phishing. You have to. Well, you just got to use your Wagogun free pass and just go illegally fishing on the Han River. <laughs> <laughs> All right, next question. How's the Russian food in Seoul? Actually, there is not much. Uh, you can find uh, Russian restaurants in the um, Dendemon. Because in Dendemon, there is a very big community of the people who came from the Uzbekistan, Kyrgyzstan. And, uh, a lot of stands over there. Yeah. So And they opened the restaurants actually sell food that was that we used to eat in the USSR. So it's a mix between the stands and Russian food. So you can order a lot of good stuff there. What do you recommend? Well, the most popular, I think, uh, it's a kind of barbecue on the stick. So it's a lamb. Usually it's a, in Russia, it's made from lamb meat. Oh, you yeah, put they, on they the that. stick and you... There's so, something similar that Koreans... Well, I, I should say that the the Josanjok uh, do here uh yangochi right so there, there, there's many chinese and chinese koreans that you know when they open up a restaurant here it's mm-hmm. typically lamb yeah i know that it, this uh, is a little bit different though yeah it's a bit the i mean in chinese it's a uh, the pieces are very small yes i mean the taste is not the same i mean when you do the i mean that uh, ussr bar- barbecue the pieces of meat are quite big and the, they are much more has much more how to say liquid in it i mean Juicy. Juicy, yeah. <laughs> if you could create your own video game, like unlimited capital, unlimited resources, uh, what kind of game would it be and what would it be called? Uh, my, my, my favorite game is, uh, my favorite type of games, it's uh, open world RPGs. It's, uh, if you heard, uh, I mean, the Elder Scrolls series, Gothic game. So if, if I will make a game, it will be something like Skyrim, similar to this type of games. Op- big open world. With so, in addition to, to your I Heart Putin shirt, you all you also have an I Heart Bethesda shirt. Yeah. <laughs> Is there a film industry in Turkmenistan? And if so, are there any movies that you grew up watching that are just actually totally out of this world? In USSR, we had a really good movies that was produced in Russia and all the republics. I mean, in all the republics, you had the local studios that was producing the films, and there are couple maybe i remember the films that was produced by in turkmenistan that actually i was enjoying watching mostly right now i, I don't think i i never heard about any tur- films that are quite good from turkmenistan That's too bad so when you um when you have vacation time um i understand that you are now going to moscow more often you own some property there you have some family there now um when you tell people friends family that you live and work in south korea what kind of reactions do you get i i mean the usual joke when you say that you are in korea the the usual joke you get it's a uh, which one <laughs> are you sure they're joking because i pretty sure lots of americans ask me that and they're not joking e- everyone knows the samsung because they're making really good phones and electronics but in russia we don't know much about korea w- what's happening here so we, they d- d- don't know much about the k- korean food and uh in general, Russians, they don't like the spicy food. The kimchi is too spicy for them. And what is your favorite stereotype about Russian people, and why is it bears? Recently, I saw the video somewhere from the Russian town in the Siberia. The bear actually walked in the supermarket <laughs> and started walking in the supermarket. Just another day. <laughs> yeah, that's in the, in the yes, former so, Soviet yes, Union. Yes, and the police came and sh- shot him. I mean, the sp- I think it was uh, not the real police bite. Last question. Uh, what would you recommend to somebody with similar interests or similar professional skills uh, and they're looking to move to Korea, you know, find find a job and get employment in the game industry or uh, as a computer engineer? If you want to be an engineer in the game industry, you, you really have to like the first games. And it, it has to be your hobby, I think, to be the good game, in, to work in the game industry. If you are an engineer, and you just want good job, I think the game industry is not the best choice because you can get the much less stressful engineering job in some big companies that do the general programming, like Amazon maybe. Generating propaganda for the Turkmenistan government. <laughs> yeah, but uh, you, st- you really have to like the gaming 
to be the engineer in the game industry. So Play lots of video games. Yeah, that's the lesson yeah, from yeah. this episode. Mm -hmm. Dimitri, thank you so much for coming on the show. Yeah, thank you, Arias. A big thank you to Dimitri, and just a quick disclaimer, the views shared in the show are Dimitri's and Dimitri's alone and do not reflect those of Epic Games or Epic Games Korea. Sorry, lawyers made me do it. As always, do like the show on Facebook and Instagram, rate Settlers of Soul on iTunes, it's the fastest way to help grow our audience. See you next time. Thank you.